made it to my stress there. <laughs> um, cool. I hope everyone can hear me online. Um, I should put the chat on. Anyone has anything to say? Okay. So I think you guys have got me for four weeks. Um, one, two, three, four. So just did the first two hour block. Um, I'll do a little review so I can make sure we're all caught up. I like to always like to go over stuff again in case I feel like I missed anything. Just a little bit of a introduction to Julia doing a mathsy type problem. You would have had a bit of stuff in the boot camp that's like, you know, just some basic syntax stuff. But we start doing a real problem. Whole educational point is like sometimes analysis is really difficult, and having a computer to help you out can make a huge difference. Um, a little bit of propaganda about why you should care. Um, then we started with the interesting stuff, which is basic data types that are useful for mathematicians. We're going to slowly, it's like, I don't know if you noticed this, but slowly I'm sort of like introducing more and more types. I keep saying type, but I haven't really explained what it is. Don't worry about that. I, I'm trying to trick you and just lull you into a false sense of security that you think you know what it is, because nobody really knows what it is. This is one of these things with programming what data modeling and data types and all that stuff is actually kind of confusing and something people get very wrong. Um, we started with the natural numbers and unsigned integers, different bit lengths, how they're encoded. This is the interesting one though, is the signed integers where if we want to represent negative numbers, it's kind of wonky. Why is it wonky? This is where the course got a little bit hard. We have this funny thing going on in logic and it makes the logic circuit easier if you represent them this way. That's kind of one reason. There's other reasons too, but I like this reason for an explanation. Um, yeah, a little bit about types of stuff. And then I started with Julia. I don't think you need the hello world stuff, but it's kind of looking at this thinking, you did it in the bootcamp. Did you do some stuff on arrays and array manipulation? Did you see any of that stuff or not really? Not much. Let's do that. Just so you start. So, okay, draw shift plus plus. Is that big enough for everyone to see? Cool. So again, I'll start a REPL session. So I was doing this stuff. I was going like, say, data equals a rand, and you get this array of type vector. So again, useful function. I'm always going to point it out. Type of data is a vector which is a, in this little gray brackets can you guys see that on that screen that looks all right it's an alias of an array float 64 size one so something you might do though is you might go rand 100 100 and you go type of data it says it's a matrix and this is an array of float 64 size two so dimension yeah so like it, it aliases, it's so this matrix and vector just alias to whatever it is. And you can do arrays in higher and higher dimensions. Like if you want to, it's going to get big though. <laughs> so array three, it gives up on giving it a name. It should call it, maybe it would call it a tensor or something if it was pretentious, but <laughs> multi-linear array. Um, yeah, so that's an array. We'll just worry about vectors though. You can make a vector of anything. So if I go like X, equals, sorry, square brackets, square brackets for an array, you can go blah, sorry, blah, blah, blah. So that's a vector of type string. And you can do other things. You could do whatever other exotic types we want, complex, two, complex, pi. Oh, sorry, one. What is it? Do that. Can't remember the syntax. Um, your vector of, you know, complex numbers, and you can have mixed types, which is where you'll start to see this will get interesting. If it gets a little bit confusing, it's a vector of type any. So there's a type hierarchy in Julia. This will come up later on, but I just kind of thought I'd show it to you early on, so you see it and a little bit less confused when it comes up again, and you go into the guts of it. Um, Saying about types is important because of this thing I've sort of mentioned, maybe, did I mention dispatch, multiple dispatch? Has that come up in the course already? It's kind of like underlying Julia, but the design paradigm is this principle called multiple dispatch. And it's really confusing as to why you'd care when you're a beginner, so don't worry about it. When Claire comes in section five, I imagine she's probably going to talk about that. I'll give you some simple examples probably in the next section of why dispatch is useful, but just a thing coming on the plate. 
I showed you a little bit of type annotation, so I thought I'd just say a little bit more about it now. But um, okay, some useful things though, rather than some abstract stuff, is if we go go back to this guy. Say I want to add one to every element in this array. I could do something annoying for uh, i in to length data. I didn't type that right. I've got to shout out if I make mistakes. Data i plus equals one. So annoying thing. So Julia, one-based indexing, has that come up already? So the first element in an array is going to be one, which annoys some people. You don't have to do it that way. This is actually a fairly terrible way to do that. So uh, maybe not the best example to show it, but every element in the array has been incremented by one if I do that. I could make a function for doing this. It's kind of annoying though. This is actually like terrible way to do it. It's kind of clunky. So you've got some options for doing that. So say one thing you can do is this operation called broadcasting. So if I want to go, I'll pick a more nice function. So I can go square root of three and I get just the value three. Can actually do the square root of a vector make sense? Maybe, kind of. Maybe. Square root of a matrix makes more sense to me, but a vector is kind of weird, like a square matrix. There's something kind of like a square root, but if I do square root data, it's going to go, oh, method error. But if I want to apply it to every element one by one, I can do, is everyone familiar with broadcasting from Python or dot in Julia? Has this come up before? Uh, MATLAB has the dot, okay. It's a little bit more exotic than MATLAB's dot though in this one, because I can actually make function. So we could do this, all the function, all the base functions, you can go like sign of data, if you want to apply a sign to it. I can also do something pretty exotic where I go function, almost sign, x. And what this will do is return x plus a little bit of random noise. Okay, so almost sign of one adds a little bit of fluff to it. If I try and apply this to data, again, it's going to go like method error, but I can actually broadcast my own functions over the data. So that's kind of cool. Oh, uh, it's actually quite powerful, this how broadcasting. I actually think it's kind of terrible syntax, but what are you going to do? But you have other options too. So I'll just plot this so you can see. There you go. Oh, didn't quite do what I wanted, but I probably need to make the thing a bit smaller. Let's try that. So almost sign. I realize I showed this to you yesterday and didn't talk about it as well. So have those afterwards thoughts. So if we go a bit bigger, well, where did it go? Almost sign. Oh, did I make a mistake? X plus. Anyway, you get the picture. I won't talk about it too much, but you can broadcast your own functions. Another thing you can do is more long-winded way. Has anyone come across filters and maps before in any other language? You want to say what they are? Uh, Java app applies the text function. Yeah. Yep, so you've got access to that. So it's actually doing the same thing underneath. You can go map goes to sign X of a collection. So you can go 0 0.1, 20, and it will apply that same thing. It's just like different ways to do it. Another useful one that's a friend of map is filter. So let's go, let's try and think of something interesting to do. So filter, you always have this thing of like, I want to make and construct an array, all these, these things constructors, and then you go like, oh, but I want to cut some out of them. So like, let's go. Matt filter. Let's go. X goes to, and this takes a predicate for a filter. So you got to, if I say a predicate, does anyone's eyes go, Ooh, know what that is? Predicate? Function that returns a Boolean value. So something that you put in, it gives you a true or a false. So I can do something like X greater than zero, minus one, 0 0.01, to one. 
And it should just return the positive values for that. So just in case that's not clear, let's go size. That's 201. If I do that guy, it's only 100 long because it's cut out all the negative ones. Cool. Just a little array things. I thought I'd give that to you at the start. Another one that's interesting is this came up in the lecture and I didn't really talk about it. I thought about it afterwards and I wanted to, didn't want it to say is, I thought I should tell you. If I'm doing this little array creation syntax, what do we think the type of that guy is? Is that going to be a vector or not? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this thing is like, you don't really want to make all the elements to pass it through a function. So you don't need to do that. So like, particularly if you're going to make a huge iterator, this is the idea of an iterator. You just want to have a thing that will give you, give me the next, give me the next, give me the next. So this construction is a step range length of blah, 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 blah. If you want to get the vector from it, you do this function called collect. Then you've got the vector back. So just a thing to save memory. You don't really need to do that. So here we go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I think there was one in the notes that's like sum of one on n four i. Sorry. One on n. That's not going to do anything, is it? Four i in one to 10. Oh, did I get it wrong? No, I oh. Yeah, because it was a function. So you can do this thing. You can pass this guy. That's another thing you can do. You can actually do a comprehension is another version of this thing of creating an array. Have you just done comprehensions in Python? Is that a thing? Array comprehensions? You want to? Yes? Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. It's the same sort of thing. You can go like sign x or x in 1 to 100. Cool. So I think I did broadcasting, list comprehension, and map. All kind of different ways you can do the same thing. Really useful constructors for arrays. You've always got this problem of like, I want to start something and make an array to begin with. You can do these things, and you can kind of do arbitrarily complicated things in here if you make your own functions and pass them through. Cool. Okay, so first part of the story, I think we got there. So square root. So this is going to get a little bit interesting. So um, again, wanted to do, we started with a sort of fluffy maths problem of like, I want to count how many times a new thing turns up in array and see the statistics of that. This one's interesting to me. It's like, how does this thing on my calculator, when I get my calculator and I go like square root 25 or logarithm 25, how does it actually do that inside is what we're going to do today. So it's kind of confusing. Like, again, we had these tables of logarithms and trigonometric functions. It's like, what's it actually doing inside? And for this one, I'm just going to do square root. So there's a built-in thing. I just showed this before, square root. You want to know what it does. There's a lot of stuff there, so they're probably taking it fairly seriously. And this one I was saying before, square root of a matrix kind of makes sense, um, but under some conditions. So if A has no negative real eigenvalues, blah, 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 blah. This idea of a Cholesky decomposition, but depends on the type. So you can take square roots of, we're just talking about real. So today, yeah, last time we went about natural numbers, integers. Today we're going to talk about reals, and I'm not going to talk too much about floating point, but... Well, if you have questions about that, we can do it. We're going to cover that in more detail later on. But there's a built-in function for square root. If I give it an int, what's the return type going to be? You know, I want to guess. Float. 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 Yeah, it doesn't have to be. Like, you know, like if I picked one that was like a square, you know, it's not going to return an int four. It would be nice if it did, but it's not going to because it's not that clever. Um, so... Yeah, so you can take square roots of different types. So we've got an int. If we want to do this 2f0, I was saying about making a 32-bit uh, float, you can do that. And the return type of that, though, in this case, is going to be a float 32. So it keeps the type for floats, but for ints, it converts to a 64. What is it going to do for an int 32? I don't actually know, but <laughs> that's a question for another time. 
So we're starting to get a bit of floating point shenanigans. So this is what we're going to talk about later on. If I do square the square root of this two, I don't quite get the same thing back. This is this floating points are an approximation of the real numbers. They're not real numbers themselves. This is like curse for numerical analysts, people who do computational code. You get floating point problems all the time. It's the thing your number one thing you're fighting, depending on the type of work you're doing. But um, we'll talk about that later on. Uh, probably covered this already, but if I put, I've got to put a function there. Square root of minus one, what's that going to do? Error. But I showed you this before. Complex square root will do something, but again, type of square root is a complex type float back. So you have to, it won't promote to a complex number because it's probably going to cause you more problems than it solves. <laughs> Like, sometimes you wish it would. Tell, tell Matt Lab that. Tell Matt Lab that, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you give a square bracket one, it gives the first real number. Can a complex number do that? So what do you mean? Sorry, so that... You give a complex number and you give us a square bracket and one in it, will you give, will it give the real number? Do you want to have a go and show me on the code? <laughs> or to... If you index complex number. Oh, okay. Do you mean, oh, if I index, sorry, sorry. So if I say like square root A equals this. Yeah. No, 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 no. But, oh, should I teach you naughty things? Okay. You can do this dot. And if I press tab, you'll see there's two parts that are kind of hidden in the struct there. You can go in. That's the imaginary part and real. And there's probably but. That's not what you're supposed to do. Remember last time I probably showed you a struct where I went like my rational. If I go my rational one, two. Oh, sorry, got to actually make a thing there. Y dot the nom num. You see those elements of the struct come through. This is kind of like secret stuff. You're not meant to go poking around through structs like that. So you probably have something like, I don't actually know this. So I might embarrass myself. Real. Square root. Oh. Let's talk about this. Yeah, you can do real and the match. There'll be functions for accessing the elements of the struct. Not you can poke around and get them out by the doing this little dot tab thing. But usually, if you're making your own structs, you'll have these accessor functions for dealing with them. That's kind of the whole point. But if you want to go poking around and rip stuff out, you can do that too. Okay, cool. Let's see. Okay, so this is where I had to debug the notes because they this annoying thing they changed they changed Julia every year. So like there's like a one point ten this time. Last time we're doing the course it was one point nine. This including interactive utils is kind of annoying, but I'll tell you about it because it's a story about real computer programming that. In interactive sessions, you get a bunch of functions and macros included. I'll talk about macros in a second that you don't get if you're running in a non-interactive session. So one of these is these things like at which. So in this guy, if I go at which, it's there. I can ask about what it is. Cool, that's fine. I think last time, I'll just start VS Code here. So if I go at which, sign. You'll see Julia test error. Ah, oh, man, there's no at which to find. So in this non REPL session, these functions aren't included, but in a REPL session, you get them. So you have to do this annoying thing of using interactive type. It works now. <laughs> so just because of the notes, that's why that weird line's in there. But I thought I should explain it to you so you don't get confused. Okay. But what does this at which do? Because that's not interesting. This is the interesting stuff. So if we go at which where root two. Okay. Oh, did help. Okay. So it gives you 
this is pretty cool. Gives you at base math.jl15, blah, 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 blah. So you can actually, this will come out as a hyperlink. And you can go to the Julia source code and find where which is implemented. So this will be, it's the line number. So we can see here, at which blah, blah, blah. This is the stuff I was showing yesterday where it's going, this, this is a type real, this is what we're going to do. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, oh, go back to the notes. Okay, and square root two. Oh, yep, square root. You'll see that for a different type, it'll end up in a different spot in the code. That was the whole point I was trying to get to with this one. So again, functions dispatch on the type of the argument. So you'll have a method for each type. And you can actually, because Julia is open source, good thing about like this non-proprietary stuff is you can go and poke around in the gut and see what it's actually doing. So this one's on line 15, this one's on there. Um, I can't remember. We'll have a look at that guy too. I don't know if it's very informative because it's like, it's one of these things. We'll talk about this at the end, but optimized code ends up being a bit funny. But this is the one we want to do. So you notice a good bit of hygiene here where they're going, if X is less than zero and then throw complex domain error square root blah. So this is this error we we're running into before where we tried to put minus one in. It's going like, oh, you can't do that because it's negative. So if this is of a union type of float 32, so float 32 and float 64, It'll go, okay, do this. So interesting question. Do we get a small float? 16. That'll still do it, but it goes to a different point in the code. But interesting point is it's going this exotic function. It pass if it passes this line. So this shortcut evaluation, that's what this and and is. So that's a nice little bit of syntax you might want to see. Does this sort of funny function here, square root LLVM. Has anyone heard of LLVM? You have, yep. It's like a system for creating file program languages. Yeah, like that's right. So I think we've got it in the notes here. I'll just head back. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, oh, I think, I think I jumped ahead in the notes. Oh yeah, no, no, here we go. But a bit about broadcasting, I already talked about that. So square root LLVM compiles to low level virtual machine. So this is a, compiler toolchain, low-level compiler toolchain. So we're going to talk a little bit, I think someone asked me a question at the end of the last lecture about like, Julia seems fast, why is it fast? And it's like type inference max matched with LLVM, passing to LLVM. So LLVM is, it's not machine code, but it's like creates machine code. So like there's all these layers down to, until you get to the CPU. This um, project is by, this guy is kind of famous. I don't know, Vikram, sorry, if he's probably he's probably famous too, but Chris Latner, has anyone heard of him? Yeah. He made Swift. Obviously. Made Swift. And he's also doing something interesting at the moment where he's making a language called Mojo with, I think Jeremy Howard has something to do with UQ, I think, but um, those two guys are making a fast superset of Python. So it's kind of a competitor, Julia, in a way. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, super interesting thing about like, Make program it makes it's made making programming languages really easy. So a lot of modern programming languages are based on LLVM. So Julia is one of this family of stuff. Um, if you want to hurt your brain, we can do this. We get um, we've got these funny macros. I didn't say what they were. So a macro in Julia's got this little at symbol at the front, and a macro dumb way of thinking about it is a program to write programs. <laughs> So if you don't want to, if you don't know something and you want to like build it as you go, you can do this thing called metaprogramming, where it's programs that write programs. And Julia is actually really powerful for metaprogramming. And you'll maybe, maybe Claire will talk to you about this later on, but I know Andy did. I don't know if we'll keep that bit or not. So anyway, that'll come back later. So macro program that writes program. You can actually see the LLVM code that gets generated for this. So let's see. code LLVM if we do this. So this is why we use high level languages because this is more what's going on at a level below. So define double square root, blah, 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 blah. And then does some of this stuff and then it calls out to this square root float 64, this method here. So whatever, that's not why you don't write in low level languages. Um, LLVM, so Julia, 
goes to a thing called an abstract syntax tree, and then that gets passed to LLVM, and then that gets passed to machine code, depending on which program you're running. So LLVM is meant to be this portable thing about different CPU architectures. LLVM will be the same, but then when it actually runs on the CPU, it'll be doing different things. No, no, no. So this is LLVM gets generated, or this is generated by Julia, and it gets passed off to some runtime thing, and then that gets run in machine code. No, no, no. This is LLVM. So it's a different. Yep, 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 yep. That's right. And then code. If you want to see the horrors, so if, if I had two com two different computer architectures, like if I had an AMD and an Intel, this would actually give me different things. So again, this is the horror of low-level languages, like this horrible stuff about whatever the hell is going on here. Has anyone ever had to write anything in assembly? Has that come up? A little bit, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be writing anything in assembly if you don't have to. It's kind of fun. It's an interesting thing of like old Nintendo games were all written in assembly, if they can believe that. Like that they did it. Me, it's one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not a lot of memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it matters if it's fast, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so like a lot of those old stuff were actually like video game consoles were written in assembly, if you can believe it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these funny push, move, blah, 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 blah. I think I had a point by showing you all that stuff. But again, what's actually probably going to go on though is there's going to be a specialized method for doing calculating square root on the CPU because it's important or at least a low-level version of it. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a thing. Um, oh yeah, V square root is this funny thing. So cool. If we want to do it in software, we're going to want to do something different. So for example, if you had... Um, you know, a big, so everyone come across big for big ants? Is that kind of? Oh, yeah, big homework. Big homework, you've seen that already. So you all know it from the homework before anyone's talked about it. That's good. That's a good outcome. <laughs> it's basically like, you know, we went up to 128 bits in the system. So you got like, oh, sorry, this will help. Int up to 128. Um, I talked about this. So type max function. It's a big number, but it's not that big. You can imagine applications, I don't know, integers counting like atoms or grains of sand on a beach. You know, you might need to go a bit bigger. <laughs> um, so you've got this type of big, um, you can do whatever you want. You can make something bigger than the thing before. So if you want to do that in hardware, you know, this can do it. So Julia must be doing something to actually calculate that. And it's pretty quick as well. So at which you could do this, oh, you can type, you can do this, but. Oh, it's in a, you notice it's in a different spot. I don't know if we did I show you these guys. So this guy was in base math, blah. This guy is in base something, MPFR, whatever MPFR is. So there's some other place in the code it's doing something special. Um, yeah, so interesting thing, you can go to Wikipedia and you can go like, cool, how do you calculate square roots? And go like, that's a big Wikipedia page. I'm not going to talk through that. But one method is the Babylonian algorithm. And I was kind of talking a little bit about history and stuff. It's like people have wanted to know square roots forever, right? Like Babylonia was, Babylon was a long time ago. We don't call it that anymore. <laughs> this is, I think... Called Babylonian algorithm, I think Heron or some some Greek guy was uh, the first one to write it down. So it's at least two thousand years old. I don't know history. Yeah, seventeenth century BCE. So I will try and talk about this now. What am I going to say? So if you just had some oracle and it told you, here's a magic algorithm for calculating square roots, and here's one that came here out of the ether. If I just ask you off the top of your head, how would you derive a method for calculating a square root? What would you think of? What's first thing? Trial and error. Sorry? Trial and error, like just guessing functions? <laughs> Maybe that could have been how they did it. How would you do it now, though, by analysis? What would be your first step? Anyone? Newton's method? Have you come across Newton's method before? Yeah. You do calculus, right? So they've derived an algorithm like thousands of years before calculus. 
which is actually pretty common for some of these things. There's old methods and old algorithms that predate calculus. And you're just baffling, like, how did they come up with that? Or did they just guess and check? Like, maybe maybe it was just guessing and checking, or maybe they had some magic intuition. What's that? More, more praying. Praying to the right gods. That's the problem, right? Praying to the maths gods. Um, I'll just go. I didn't have much time to prepare for this guy. Um, okay. Let's just drag this guy around. Okay, I'll come back to here. So we can implement this guy. Um, we've got a bit of syntax I'll talk through. I'm too lazy to type all this out, so forgive me. It's, I'll just copy it across and I'll talk through. So we've got this function, bab square root, takes an argument set. And we've got this thing of a semicolon, which in Julia is for a function. Did, you, did this come up when you're doing functions before? Or first time you're seeing this? First time, okay, cool. Um, this is optional named arguments. If you want to have things that they don't have to be there, you put it in with a semicolon. And yet, because they're optional, you have to give them a default value in case they're not going to be used. Yep. So this case, you know, our input argument is Z. Our init X, initial guess, is going to be just Z on two. Um, verbose, you know, if you want to do some logging, is false. And tolerance of 1e e to the minus 10. Oh yeah. Or, or if everything has default values, yeah. then you can call the function with nothing. Yeah. So if you put the comma. The you, the yeah, you do something ugly like that. I guess I don't think I've ever done that, so I assume that's right. You can try it and see, but <laughs> it's kind of a weird function if it has no arguments. That's a that's special. <laughs> okay. Cool. So that's what that that's what that syntax is. Optional named arguments. Um, so x equals init x while true verbose. We've got this same thing we saw in the notes before. You can have this short circuit evaluation. So what this will do is if this is if this predicate is true, then it'll jump onto this next line and print it. If it's not there, it'll just go through without evaluating the next bit. So this is writing out this recursive or this iterate, iterative algorithm, recursive algorithm, whatever you want to say. Um, so we've got, you know, the next element in the step is half the previous plus Z on blah. Cool. So you iterate that until tolerance. So let's have a play with this guy. So we can go bab square root of 2.0. Okay, so I didn't have to give it these arguments. It works. Um, Uh, what do you think the odds are these two? They're not equal to each other. You can see they've got slightly different answers down here. So if I go, oh, I'll just type it out, being lazy in a silly way. Okay, so there's this small, tiny, tiny difference. It's less than tolerance, but to, you know, whatever. That's a small difference. Um, so if I go equals equals, Everyone know what equals equals does? Okay. Yep, cool. So that's going to evaluate to course false. Yeah. Uh, we can go, you can go a prox. True. <laughs> What's that? Um, you can, yeah, it's again, it's optional argument. So we can go, oh, if you can type. So there's actually this function, again, this is an alias for is a prox. So you've got X, Y, and you've got an absolute tolerance and a relative tolerance, a whole bunch of things you can set. Yeah, so that's really useful for, okay, say for big homework, if you've got a question where you're going to go like, oh, did it work? And you're doing floating point stuff. It's like, hey, it kind of works. <laughs> you know, in always with floating points, it's always, oh, yeah, it kind of worked. So that's a useful function for you. Um, we got, if you want to put these arguments in, um, I'll just copy it across, being lazy. Um, so, oh, there's a bug in it. That's interesting. I'll have to have a look at that. But um, hmm. anyway, I'll, I'll not get distracted by that. I wonder why it works there. Oh, no, 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 because it's got two return values. Yeah. Okay, I think that's a typo in the notes. Okay, let's not worry too much about that. Okay, so you can see what the internal iterates are doing. Uh, 
um, yeah, interesting that that didn't work. But you can see at each iteration, it's converging on the actual answer. So if you give it a bad first guess, maybe it's not going to work. We had that. Can you remember what it was called? What was it? Init x. Let's give it a bad guess of like. Oh. Oh, sorry. So you can't have two semicolons. Oh, it still worked. How bad can our first guess be? And it still works. Oh, typo, sorry. Oh, went to negative. That's not cool. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it seems like it's actually doing quite good. I was trying to trick it and break it and it failed in front of you. That's why you should prepare for lectures. <laughs> anyway, so you get this, it's actually kind of robust. That's kind of crazy. Um, Cool. So this is, Someone guessed, was it you? Newton's method. Um, Newton's method. So I just show a little picture of Newton's method. So what we're going to do, so I guess, where would you put yourself on the spectrum of applied maths to pure maths as a show of hands? Who's on the applied maths side? And pure maths? Boo. No. <laughs> no. Pure mathematicians have one trick. It's called Taylor series. And then you truncate it at one turn. And that's everything you do. That's all you ever do. This is another instance of that. So say we've got what I've just tried to draw here is we say we've got this function in red. What we're going to do is take a Taylor series about a point, do a linear approximation, and then solve for when that equals zero. If we're actually trying to find the root of the original equation. And then we'll go over to move over to here, go up to here take another approx, go to here, take another approx. I hope you can see that. I didn't do a cool animation, but that's basically the intuition behind Newton's method. So basically for some function, I'm going to linearize it around a point and then rearrange this for solving for zero. And then I'm going to do it again and again and again. That's Newton's method. So this is the, that my talking out loud and rabbiting on. That's basically that as maths. If we rearrange that equation for where it should move to the next time if we solve for zero. Um, yeah, so this affine approximation. Um, so in a special case of we're trying to minimize, we're trying to find out when x squared minus z equals zero. So if you go through this, go through the crank, I can't do a derivative anymore, I'm broken. <laughs> too far out of uni but you should see i can do a derivative of that but um if you rearrange that that's exactly how you get this babylonian algorithm over here so that's where that comes from that's the way of deriving it taylor series but somehow four thousand years before taylor <laughs> there's someone in babylon who's angry because it's like his method or her method um yeah so that's that's how that works and basically on a computer there's other ways that are actually faster for calculating the square root I'm not going to talk about those, but you can go and look in the Wikipedia page and go like, look at all these ways that people have come. So this thing about algorithmic complexity and what's the fastest way of approximating something is a big field and people still do research on this stuff. If you get people who do into numerical methods, they get really excited by this stuff. Okay, cool. So, so it should be more of a paragraph break here because this is the point where I want to give you... Um, an insight into some clever bad code, I think. So sometimes, often you don't actually want to calculate the square root. It's actually really, really common to want the reciprocal of the square root. Does anyone think of why you'd want that? Graphics is a reason. What's the math reason? Why have you wanted as a mathematician? Yeah, a unit, it might turn something into a unit vector. You go like, I've got a vector. I want to know where it's pointing. I don't really care about how long it is. I want to multiply it by the reciprocal so I can do that. So it's a really common operation and really common. Everyone, some people, I guess, have heard of this. So you're guessing where it's going. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what would I say? So my history, where have I used this? I, has anyone heard of quaternions? Yep. All into computer graphics. Is that where it came from? Or, yeah. What's a quaternion? It's kind of like complex numbers, but they kind of. One that's more important, 3D, is there a good way of representing rotations? So yeah. Like, oh. yeah. So which, there's quaternions, but only unit quaternions represent rotations. That's the trick, right? So if you're actually doing working with quaternions, well, I don't know if I can talk properly then, but if you're working with quaternions, you have to keep renormalizing them, particularly when you propagate them through equations. Like, you know, I showed before that square root of float 32, and then I squared it and it didn't quite come back. 
if I'm passing a quaternion through an equation, it's going to go a bit wrong every time I do that. So if you have some complicated transformation chain, it's going to go a little bit wrong every time you do it, and you have to keep turning it back into a unit vector or unit quaternion, sorry. Um, I was doing that for when I was working at Fugo with flying planes around. We used to fly, did Megan talk about this? We were flying 600 meters off the ground, 200 and something kilometers an hour, and we're trying to find things on the ground to plus or minus 10 centimeters. So if you think of that lever and you think about how accurate my angles of pointing has to be to get that precision, or that accuracy even, not even precision, that accuracy, we used to use a, it was called a tactical grade inertial measurement unit. And tactical grade means you're allowed, you, you probably should be using it in a missile or a thing like that, because it's tactical because you can afford to blow it up. But it was still like $50,000 for this inertial measurement unit. So it measured accelerations and rotations, really, really fine precision. That's what we used to use. Um, I think they've moved away from those to more commercial ones now. But um, yeah, anyway, that's... That was where I had it. So I was fighting quaternions, trying to renormalize these quaternions so I don't lose numerical precision when I was going through this complicated chain. So super useful thing. Um, these functions exist in Julia. Um, so using linear algebra. Um, did this come up? This is kind of annoying. It used to be in base and it's not in base. I always want to use linear algebra. It should be imported in base. It's like this interactive utils thing. So if you want to do linear algebra stuff, you're going to need this thing. So if we have a vector that's like 5 and 5, normalize. Hey, so cool. That's a function that's built into Julia because um, it's so useful. Uh, what do I want to say? Yeah, I don't know if the... Lots of different ways. Oh, sorry, here you go. Here's a plethora of methods for doing it. So you can divide it by the norm. You can do the norm yourself. You can do the square root of this inner product. You can write it out long-winded if you want to, or you can do square root dot. All will give you basically the same answer. So there's a lot of ways you could do this, but this method comes, this is kind of infamous, right? Like um, some people have already heard of it. It's from Quake 3. Um, so Quake 3, the source code got released into the open. So it was like a thing they did in the company. And then years later, they went, hey, everyone can have a CPL code, which is annoying, but that's OK. Um, the fast inverse square root algorithm. So anyone can read anyone can read C? I just thought I'd show you another language. So just so you get a hint of like what other languages look like. Um, what we've got here is this mysterious thing. And so in C, so do you know what the comments are in Julia? If you're writing a function, you don't want it to come through. Does everyone know what that is? Ash, so you can do blah, 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 and it won't come through. So equivalent thing in C is this double slash. So what's happened is this was the original bit of code, and then someone's come through later, and they've gone like, evil floating point, bit level hacking, sanitize the notes for you. It wasn't what that actually said in the first place. And then it's first iteration, and then they've commented out the second iteration because it's like, oh, I'm doing Newton's method, but we don't actually need the second iteration. It's good enough on the first go. Cool. So we've got a couple of things here, long float. Um, I've turned this into Julia for you, so maybe it's easier to read. Um, function fast inverse square root. It takes a float 32. So back in the day, everyone had float 32, had 32 bit computers, so you didn't have to worry about float 64. Does so anyone know why this changed? Why everyone went to float, went to 64-bit operating systems? Not IP addresses. Addressing though. No, nah, wasn't that? Wasn't that? Wasn't that? Running out of RAM addresses, so you can only address four gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> so. That's the annoying reason, because there's not enough integers in, in 32. You kind of need an int 64 to address more RAM. So we'll eventually need to go to 128-bit operating systems in the year 7,000 or something. <laughs> anyway, so what we got here, this is a very, very strange thing. I'll try not to run too long on this. But what they're doing is you're going to take the number as an input, and we're going to multiply it by a half. This is a very, very strange move. And this is like equivalent to this line here, evil floating point bit level hacking. Reinterpret. Anyone have a guess what that might be? Yeah. 
it's just taking the bits um flow and treating it as if it's an integer yeah so i hope everyone realizes enough i've talked about the bit level representation of integers bit level representation of floats is another thing we'll talk about that later but it's just different right it's <laughs> It's a very strange thing to do. Like that's why these comments there are saying like it's evil bit level hacking. It's like if I took a string and interpreted it as an integer, it's the same kind of thing. It's kind of a weird, strange thing to do. So we've reinterpreted this float 32 as a uint 32. I'll just, I'll just do this. Reinterpret is a thing. There's more normal reasons for doing this. This is a very abnormal reason for doing it. So reinterpret this, do what the F magic. So this again is a nut, is an integer, is a magic number, and a bit shift. <laughs> so the equivalent line up here, we've got the same syntax for bit shift, we've got the same magic integer, and then we're going to reinterpret it back as a float, and then we're going to do one iteration of Newton's method for what you'd actually do. So who wants to guess what this bit is doing? What's that? You know. Yeah. Well, how would you make Newton's method faster? If we look at this picture and go like, you know, we're starting, we're starting from somewhere. We do this linear approximation and then we do another linear approximation. And we do another linear approximation. What's the fastest way you can accelerate this? Yep, that's perfectly it. So if you can guess the answer some other way and get really close on your first guess, you won't have to do much refinement. So that's actually what this is. This is a magic first guess. <laughs> so it's to do with the way, again, all the notes are out of order with how you should probably teach this. So I'll think about it in the future. But like, you don't know what floating point representation is. Some of you probably do, but it's kind of like taking the log and divide it, you know, if you think about like, if I've got one on square root X, if I take the log of that, it'll be like a half minus a half, blah, blah, blah. So that's what this bit shift is about. It's like a divide by two. And then there's some magic offset to deal with the floating point representation. So that's what this is. Um, and again, I can show you here that it's true. There's a nice video. I think that probably still works. Hopefully the links die on the internet all the time, but you, there's a lot of stuff on the internet. This is actually infamous. Um, so this is infamous, like you've heard of this before. Good, bad, good. What does everyone else think? Scary. Scary is what it is. Like, yeah, so it was for a video game in the 90s where everything had to be really, really fast. I guess the problem is this was someone else afterwards. Like if you look through the version control, this was added afterwards. Someone's going like, I don't know what the hell this is doing. So this is like a little lesson for you guys when you go and do your assignment. Like you can be really clever, but kind of please be nice as well as clever. <laughs> like think about the next person down the line who has to read this thing and try and understand what the hell's going on. So I think it's kind of terrible myself, but you know, I'd be pretty proud of if I did it. Um, everyone heard of John Carmack? Yeah. John Carmack, Every, this gets attributed to him, but it's not actually from him. It's actually ancient. This is like, from the 60s or something, someone came up with this clever trick for doing fast reciprocal of a square root. Um, yeah, so he's a famous video game developer, worked at Meta for a while trying to make VR. And I don't know if that worked or not, but out for him. But yeah, so yeah, pretty infamous. Um, I guess that's my teaching point for that. Um, yeah, the whole point is like, where do I want to go with this? So. You see here that we're not being exact. It's an approximation algorithm. The approximation is based on a pretty simple bit of math. It's like taking a Taylor series, truncating it at some order, and then doing that, doing a simple iterative method. So it's kind of nice. A lot of these algorithms for doing these things are based on just basically like the definition of the sort of definitional mathematical things, like taking a Taylor series. Like what's the definition of a derivative uh, integral? Like how do you define an integral? How do you define a derivative? You can kind of derive an approximate algorithm from these things. That's where we're going to go with the next section. I think that's kind of time though. I think I can't really start anything else. Um, the next two we'll give two more where example of factorial and we'll talk about, about some other stuff. Um, any questions on that so far? No? Okay. Okay. Thank you everyone.
I think we need to be really good at ten computer scientists to get to that level. Thank you. No worries.